morning. It's his wounds have paid my ransom, him and him only. You know, this body and this world, this reality that we experience here is, is so temporary. And uh, so many people think that this is it. They're really going to miss out. People that think this, that do not have a concept of, of God, it, and, and so they're reduced to these little gods. And we've read about this morning out of Psalm 82, and it happens all the time. Even people are often elevated as little gods. You know, think about American Idol, you know? I, I, I look at some of the trends and stuff. Uh, who's that? Uh, I thought of her name earlier. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost like these concert people, you, you get, they get worshipped. Uh, they, have a, they have a following like that. But anytime someone has a high esteem for an office, a relationship, a person, and expects to be satisfied at some point in perhaps the way justice is served, needs are met, or even just the way feelings or emotions of security, pleasure, excitement, or comfort are reached, this exception, this expectation, falls dangerously close to idolatry. Let's turn to Acts 14, please. There's a complex cycle of this type of idolatry that occurs in, in, in chapter 14 of Acts that we should pay close attention to. There are several stages in this cycle, and we should be aware of each stage because we may have unknowingly set up an idol. We may even have been unknowingly set up as an idol or as a, as a small god. Even atheists and agnostics run unknowingly into the same issue. I heard of one conundrum. There was, a, there was an atheist that was dyslexic, and he had insomnia. And so he stayed up all night thinking, wondering if there was a dog. <laughs> Paul and Barnabas, in this, in this passage we're going to read, were viewed as gods but treated like dogs. And this became evident to them after about the third cycle. And at that time, they did their best to shed the status. Now, I know this may sound ridiculous, but you may have a certain amount of God status and not even realize it. And the status must be shed. The gods of this world have a very short lifespan, and the shorter the span, the less damage is done. Paul and Barnabas' godhood status may have lasted less than an hour on this last occurrence, but it almost cost Paul his life. As Paul and Barnabas were proclaiming Jesus as Lord, one, of the, one group of people persecuted them and another group of people rejoiced. I know it's hard to see them pre being treated as gods just yet, but we need to be careful who we set up on a pedestal. There was a cycle going on. There was an excellent, it was an, there was excitement to hear Paul and Barnabas speak. And once they said something that, that didn't agree with one group, pretty soon their, their expectations of what their message was, was was unmet. And then all of a sudden, these people got angry. They got, they got jealous. And then hatred came. And, and then the next thing they wanted to do was they wanted to kill Paul and Barnabas. The, in Acts 14, 1, we'll start with this. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot underfoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with the teachers to mistreat them and to stone them. But they found out about it and fled to Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. 
Okay, I'm going to stop there. We'll continue on in verse 8. But just because they were mistreated, it doesn't mean that they were not involved of this cycle of being idolized. The original reaction of the Jewish leaders was really excitement. You know, whoa, this Messiah, Jesus, the Jewish, everything that the Jews were looking forward to, this Messiah, he was, he was there. He was alive. He, was, he lived his life, a perfect life. He died as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God that was slain to take away the sins of the world. And, and they realized that they understood it. And then it was, the excitement was so big that the whole city came to their synagogue. And then all of a sudden, their expectation, their low expectation of what Jesus would do caused them to, to be disgruntled against the, the messengers. And so now they were out to mistreat Paul and Barnabas. And they were out, really, we just read, they wanted to stone them. You know, this is more common than we realize. I see it happen in marriages. For instance, don't, don't raise your hand if you've ever wanted to stone your spouse. See? <laughs> Only one person raised their hand that said they don't want to stone their spouse. The rest of you didn't raise your hand. See? See what I mean? <laughs> I think Wayne might have been lying, too. <laughs> in verse 8, in Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth, and he never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was a, the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths from the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too were only men, human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from the heavens and crops in your seasons. He pro provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. Please, I can't believe he went back into the city after they just stoned him. But uh, we'll keep our place here, and we're going to turn to 1 Timothy 1.15. You know, th th this, this cycle... You know, this is probably the third cycle that happened to these two possibly since they landed in Antioch, Pisidia. And the process is subtle at first, but it becomes more recognizable as each cycle manifests and intensifies. The first stage in the cycle is just often just, just good news. The news goes way beyond the scope of this world, yet people want to apply it to their limited worldview, Okay. The process of their expectations are let down, and somehow the words of freedom, a savior, and justify get lost in the translation when it's only applied to the here and now. Okay? The first step in the cycle is misplaced expectations. Misplaced expectations. Paul and Barnabas, the bearers of this fantastic news, wrongly became the focus of the expectations. They were the ones that the mobs looked for, not only for the answers, but also the fulfillment of them. And they placed high expectations on them that were impossible to perform. When this occurred, Paul and Barnabas reached the status of gods, little, little g-gods. Like I said earlier, it, it's more common than we think. 
And one of the things I do when I, when I have premarital counseling is the first thing I do is, is say, knock, knock their spouses off their pedestals, okay? This spouse that you have is, is, not gonna, is not gonna meet your needs, not gonna meet your emotional, your spiritual, your, your real needs are have only to be met by Christ, okay? Your fiance is not a God, okay? Now, it may seem like the status of Godhood is pretty awesome, you know? But the cycle continues, and the Godhood status becomes very disturbing position because the second stage in the cycle is unmet expectations. You see, a person can only meet a person's expectations for a limited time before reality hits, and these expectations are not being met. Okay, that's what happens in a marriage. You know, boom. Oh, you're not the person I thought I married. Uh, it happens. Um, and Paul and Barnabas, they had a honeymoon too, and the expectation stage was very short-lived. They did the right thing. They revealed that they were flesh and blood, just, just like people. You know, Paul does this often in his epistles. Paul says, Paul says, hey, I'm following Christ, okay? You can follow me like I follow Christ, but get this straight. I am not there. I have not arrived. In fact, in, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And then he says, of whom I am the worst. But for this very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, and again, he says, calls himself the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, take your focus off of me. Take your focus off of all the things and, and, and psh, to him be the glory forever. Please, let, let's, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 8, starting with verse 2. When expectations are not met, people get upset. You know, they're, they're let down and somehow they feel that the one in whom they place the expectations on are to blame. And this brings us to the third stage of the vicious cycle. It's basically hatred over unmet, misplaced expectations. You can, you can see the cycle in the lives of Paul and Barnabas. And let me tell you something. It happened to Jesus as well. Not that Jesus wasn't God, but because their expectations of Jesus were misplaced. See, a lot of times in our, in our expectation of Jesus, we want him to, to feed us, right? To heal us, to protect our families, and, and, and to, 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 to take care of our lives in the here and now. Jesus basically took that expectation down. He says, in this life, you will have trouble, okay? If you follow me, okay, it's, it's a death sentence. I liked, uh, I, was, I was talking to some pastors this week, and we were talking about baptism, and, uh, and one of the pastors says, when, we, when, I, when I baptize people in my church, I tell them, this is, th your life is, 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 is going to change because you're making a declaration of war. Declaring Jesus Christ as Lord and accepting him as Savior and displaying that in front of everybody through baptism is a declaration of war. And you will be attacked and get ready to fight. Okay? So by making Jesus a little God, people make it through a vicious cycle of, of crucifying, him on, crucifying him on the cross. I mean, he was God. He was perfect. He didn't make any mistakes. But he didn't... They, they expected him, this Messiah, he's going he's gonna to overthrow Rome. He's going to keep feeding us this, this bread and stuff. They followed him. So you, you say, I, I, I fed you bread. That's why you followed me. And he, they expected him, hey, he's going to just keep on healing. He's going to keep resurrecting. And, and, and they, they, they took Jesus as, as God, the eternal God that, that takes care of our eternal life in the future and expected him, hey, he's... They downgraded him and, and misplaced his expectations for just the here and now. 
And we do. Do we do that? And, and, and when we do that, do we kind of get upset a little bit? Jesus, what? How could you? They crucified him on the cross. They made him a little G God, not a big G God. You know, the mobs expected their God to do for them. Oh, oh, he healed them and he fed the masses and everything. But they wanted him for now. They limited him to just this. And, and, and the Bible says, he that lives only for this life in, 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 in Christ Jesus is to be pitied more than all men. Because of people's misplaced expectations were not met in Jesus, they were filled with hatred. And they put Jesus to death on the pedestal of the cross. This paradigm of hatred over unmet, misplaced expectations is stomach mentality. It's an attempt to satisfy something spiritual with physical or, or the other way around. You know, there's a form of godliness, but it's misplaced. And it all needs to come back front and center to the first and the, and the greatest commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And you shall have no other gods before me. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 8, starting with verse 2, the man who thinks he knows something and does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food, sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Let's, let's turn to Philippians 3.13. You know, God only serves the purpose to fill our earthly stomachs, to fill our, our temporary needs, our temporary wants, our temporary ah. These expectations are limited to bringing us just the food, the pride, the happiness, the wealth, the power, the status, etc. It's temporary. This is not what the Father is about. This is not what Jesus is about. This brings us to the fourth and final stage of the cycle. It's devastating consequences because of hatred over unmet, misplaced expectations. Paul and Barnabas could not live up to the status of godhood, and it should be obvious to everyone here that no one in this room can live up to the status of godhood. And if we can reason this out from Scripture or even just from experience, why does this cycle happen? Why do we allow it to happen? You know, like I said, it, it, this, this cycle happens in marriages. It, it, it happens in businesses. It, hap it happens in churches. It happens in governments. This is, this is one of the main reasons I, I feel that marriages fail. They have too high expectations, misplaced expectations for their spouse. You know, these expectations are not met, and then hatred and then devastating consequences. This is one of the big reasons for many churches' splits. And, you know, how do we stop this cycle? You know, as we look at Paul and Barnabas' record, it seems unavoidable. Yet I believe Paul came to a huge realization with this last event. It was like God was telling Paul and Barnabas, I, I know you're not proclaiming to be gods, but here's these people that are actually going to sacrifice to you like you're a god. And it's got a reality check. Aha! Now I know. And, and, and they, they, they ripped their clothes. They said, we're just flesh and blood. And, and, and I think that's why Paul continually says, I am the chief of sinners. I, I, I haven't arrived yet. Please, please, please look to Jesus. He is the focus. And then he constantly put up the expectations of, of our Jesus to, hey, this is, he's eternal, okay? Last week we read out of Colossians, you know, he that wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. I mean, this is the reality of this life that we have here. We're not living for here. When we look at Paul and Barnabas, yeah, they tore their clothes. They went to the crowds. They expressed their humanness. 
Do you see how quickly this turns ugly? Lower your expectations of the gods of this world. They're nothing at all. Lower your expectations of your things. Your friends, your church, your relationships, your food, your activities. More than that, just kick down the pedestals. Remove all the little gods. And and most of all, move God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit where they belong. Set them up in their eternal status. And move your expectations of God to the unfathomable width, depth, height, and length of his eternal love that he has for you. And tear your clothes. Expose your humanness. Admit your ignorance and lack of knowledge. In other words, be humble. Godhoodness is overrated. And and, and forgive. That's part of, we need to forgive each other. We never have to forgive God because he's perfect. But we need to forgive each other and, and God forgives us. Paul's being treated like a God was not a good experience. And I don't know if this was a turning point to Paul's lowering of himself or if Paul was humble from the beginning of his conversion. But a near-death experience can certainly get one's attention. And, and some people feel that this experience right here is when Paul says, I, I know of a man that went and, and saw things unexpressible. And I think this might have been the event that he actually left his body and, and uh, in death saw Jesus in, in, in his eternity. You know, Paul was very transparent about this and his weakness in his writings. And even though he calls people to follow him and he follows Christ, he calls himself the least and the worst of sinners. You know, sometimes he would even admit his lack of knowledge. And in Philippians 3, verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say it again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. And, and he says, it's, this is they, their focus, even, even, even with Jesus, their focus is just on the earthly things. In verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's turn back to Acts 14, 21. As as, as we see here, there's another reference to to the little G God. And this is a pivotal decision for everyone. It, it's so easy to think in earthly terms. It's so easy to put high expectations in mere men. Paul and Barnabas not only tore their clothes and showed their humanness, they also pointed to the one true God. Paul and Barnabas gave God the credit for all the good, the rain, the crops, the food, and the joy that came as a result. They gave God the credit for making heaven and earth. They, they tried desperately to transfer this delusional mob's unattainable expectation of them to an eternal expectation in the unfathomable God of grace. You know, again, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You know, if you made the transfer, this is huge. And it goes beyond what our minds can conceive. You see, naturally, we think worldly. That's our, that's, our, that's our sin nature. It, 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 it's how we live. I mean, we, we, we still live in this world. I, I still feel pain at loss. 
And I can't, I, I, I can't imagine some of your, your losses re- recently. But there's, there's a way to lift ourselves up out of that pain, out of that sorrow, and, and, and put our expectations in the eternal, the unfathomable God. You see, our families will fail us. Our government will fail us. Your pastor, he's going to fail you. And you will fail you. Even Jesus will fail you as a little G God. Jesus as a big G God does not fit in the limitations of the natural earthly mindset. When we put our hope in Jesus for this world only, like I said, we're to be pitied most, most among all men. He's so beyond that. And when people do this, they, they are setting themselves up for a destructive cycles, starting with misplaced expectations in Jesus. They will find their expectations unmet. They will get angry and finally be destroyed because of belief in Jesus was misplaced. Jesus must be Savior and God, the eternal wise king. If we find ourselves unsatisfied, disgruntled, or angry, angry, please consider Jesus as Lord of your eternal life instead of the little G God of this temporary world. Become a true believer in Jesus and amazing realities will flood out of the light and momentary troubles of this life. As Paul and Barnabas tracked on their missionary journey, they found many that had made Jesus their Savior and God. It wasn't all bad. It was good. They found many that had placed their expectations in, in Jesus as a big G God and, and gave them hope beyond the limits of this world and beyond even the limits of their imaginations. Starting with verse 21 again, they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships, okay? There, there, there's, there's bringing our expectations. There's Paul. We must, our expectations of Jesus, we got we to gotta realize, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atala, Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed by the grace of God to the work that they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And, and here's basically the journey that, that they went. That's their first Paul's missionary journey. And uh, it was big. It was huge. Again, it's so easy to have accidentally placed a little G God in the place of the big G God. And some of the clues of this may be that we want to lynch somebody for no apparent reason other than a list of unmet expectations. You know, it may not be the person that we're focused on lynching that is our God, but maybe it's the unattainable expectations that we've placed in the office. Whether it is a spouse, a parent, a child, a teacher, a board member, a pastor, or a president of the United States, our anger over unmet, misplaced expectations may cause some devastating consequences as enemies of the cross. You know, oh, if I could get this across to, to, to so many people that are angry with God. You know, sometimes I ask people, you know, why are you angry with God or why don't you believe in God? We'll get back to the, the atheists, you know. And, and, and I ask them, who is this God that you don't believe in? Can you describe him to me? And... Uh, and what are your expectations of this God that you're so angry with? Can you, can you describe what you want this God that you don't believe in to, to accomplish? You know, what would, what would he accomplish? And then when I ask those questions, I says, well, that's, that's not my God. My God's ways are unfathomable. And my God's ways are, are eternal. He's, he, he's, he, 
he allows this sin of this world to, to run its course because that's just what he allowed so that, so that he could have, in my estimation, so that we could have a choice. And if, you'd, if you don't have a choice, it's not love, it's program. We're not programmed. Ultimately, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that, that stops us from being hateful for our unmet, misplaced expectations so we can turn to the cross and see that God has forgiven us for all of that. And we can look with overwhelmed joy because of the unfathomable grace of God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today. Father, God, we lift you up to the pedestal that you belong on. With your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, help us to throw away our little gods, our idols, the things that we look to for, for comfort, for excitement, for, for, for something that will never meet our eternal needs. Lord, we repent in dust and ashes before you, God. And we accept your grace. And we accept your, your payment on the, of your son on that cross and the eternal life that comes through belief in him. Lord, Lord we just thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and we'll